Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the comments on the videos posted on YouTube and over on Odyssey. Also, sometimes these questions and comments come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is actually really two questions that kind of go hand in hand. The first one, Hey DT. Please take a look at Nobara. It'd be really interesting if you interviewed Glorious Eggroll on that video too. And then along the same lines, hey DT, are you going to be reviewing this Steam Deck? Okay, so Nobara. Uh, Nobara is a rather new Linux distribution that is designed for gaming. It is a gaming distribution. It was developed by Glorious Eggroll. Glorious Eggroll is a developer. He's done a lot of work over the years to really help improve and optimize gaming on Linux to, to get this whole gaming on Linux experience to the level that it that it's been over the last few years. We owe a lot to people like Glorious Eggroll. And I do think, you know, Nobara Linux is an interesting project and I think it would be cool to interview Glorious Eggroll but here's the thing I'm not the right person for that because I'm not a gamer so I can't really review Nobara Linux the right way because I'm not going to install it and actually do any kind of serious gaming on it I don't know anything about gaming technology and the whole gaming ecosystem the gaming lingo I'm not a gamer I mean like everybody I will occasionally play simple games on my computers or on my phone or something right but i'm not, i'm not a serious gamer i've never been like a hardcore gamer well i guess maybe when i was a a young child back when the consoles first came out atari and the first nintendo system you know i gamed a lot then in those younger days we didn't have a lot to do you know 40 years ago though right as a kid those things were just really really neat those console systems but as i got into my teenage years and certainly through my entire adult life I'm not a gamer. I've never been a serious gamer. I just, I, I really don't care about gaming that much. Typically, the only time I play a game, you know, is if I need to decompress or something, you know, I've had a long day and maybe a long week. You know, sometimes I'll fire up a game and play for 10 or 15 minutes, like a first person shooter or maybe a quick game of zero AD or something. But typically, you know, I can go weeks, if not months without playing a game. Seriously. And uh, as far as the Steam Deck, I don't own a Steam Deck. The last time I logged into my Steam account was probably weeks ago, maybe months ago. It's been a long time. I can't, I can't even remember the last time I actually logged into my Steam account. I might not even remember my Steam password. I hope I saved it somewhere like in my password manager. So I'm not going to be buying a Steam Deck. I, I, I wouldn't buy one for myself anyway because I never use it because it's designed to be a gaming console right a handheld gaming device and because i just don't game or at least i don't game enough to where it would make sense for me to make such a purchase for myself no i, I won't be taking a look at the steam deck i won't be taking a look at nobara linux probably but for those of you that want gaming content especially gaming on linux content obviously check out the gaming on linux website for those of you that are wanting video content check out the youtube channel gardner bryant gardner bryant the linux gamer right check out his channel especially here in the last few months he's really focused heavily on content related to the steam deck moving on the next comment comes from a video where i mentioned a dwm and the ability to patch dwm with a patch for adding the ability to add key cords. Key cords are key bindings that are, well, think about Emacs. So Emacs has key combinations such as control X followed by control C. That's a, called a key cord because it's essentially two separate key bindings, one right after another. That way you don't have to enter like four keys all at the same time. You do control X and then raise your hand off the keyboard, then do control C. That completes the key cord. DWM has a patch that allows for those kinds of key chords. And in this video, I get this comment. Hey, DT, I'm the author of the keyboard patch. I'm glad you like it. I saw that you installed the older version of the patch, which uses a lot of mALloc, realloc, and mCPI. So this is uh, programming terms, uh, C programming terms, because that's what DWM is written in, the C programming language. He goes on to say that because he utilized those particular functions, right, it says... 
that would make the window manager very slow sometimes and might lead to crashes. This is my bad since I labeled the date wrong on the new patch. Please use the DWM keyboard 6.2 diff. This changes the implementation to a stack allocated array that makes it way faster and avoids crashes. Thank you for showing my patch to others. Well, I appreciate the, the comment. I'm glad you let me know that I downloaded the wrong patch. He says it was his fault because he actually dated his, uh, his patch ROM, because every time there's a new patch, obviously he's going to release it for the new version of DWM. And I guess he got the dates mixed up to where I thought I was downloading the latest version of the Keycord patch, and I was actually downloading an older version and installing it. So I will try to make those changes to my configuration. Eventually, I haven't noticed any major issues with it, though thankfully I haven't noticed any crashing or anything, but I probably do need to go grab that latest patch and use it. And I really appreciate you for letting me know, and of course, for your great contribution to the community with that keycord patch. Moving on, the next comment comes from uh, one of my past HeyDT videos. I get a lot of questions. People ask me the strangest questions, sometimes personal questions like, Hey DT, are you married? Hey DT, do you have any kids? Hey DT, what is your favorite flavor of Jello? <laughs> you get weird questions. And of course, I often get questions like, Hey DT, why do you use Arco Linux. Hey DT, why do you use Emacs? Hey DT, why do you use the Brave browser? You know, weird questions that I'm not sure why these people are asking this question. I never respond to it because it's a silly question to begin with. And I can tell other people in the comments section also get annoyed by the people that ask kind of these pointless questions. So this comment is, Hey DT, dude, you get some strange questions like, Hey DT, why did you make videos about the software you like and put it on your YouTube channel? Well, the answer could be because I like it and it's my channel. Smiley face. <laughs> Appreciate the comment and you're exactly right. I, I, I use the software that I've chosen to use and why do I use it? It's because I chose to use it and it's working for me. That's it. And it's a strange question because why do I need to justify my choices of software to you when you ask this question, almost like you're interrogating me? Why are you using that piece of software? I'm not going to respond. I, I don't I, I don't owe you an explanation for my choices of anything in life, but especially the software I use on my computer. I don't have to justify it to you. And guess what? You don't have to justify the choices you make in software to me either. So uh, these people that for whatever reason feel like they're entitled to ask these questions and almost in a demanding way, like they need an answer. Why are you using that particular piece of software? Because, and the next question, hey DT, why is proprietary software automatically tagged as garbage? I am not defending proprietary shadiness such as monthly subscriptions or telemetry. If a piece of software does something really well and it is easy to use, is it garbage? As a fan of technology, I try not to limit myself to what I use. Okay, so why is proprietary software automatically tagged as garbage by me? I often refer to proprietary software in general as, quote, proprietary garbage, or as I've taken recently to calling it, proprietary poo. And the reason I call it that is not because it's necessarily good software or bad software as far as from a technological standpoint. I really don't care about the code. I don't care about the functionality of the software at all. When I and other people that are free software zealots label proprietary software as, quote, proprietary garbage, right, we, we're talking about the licensing. The licensing is the issue, not the program itself. I'm not saying that, for example, a piece of proprietary software like Discord. We'll take Discord as an example. Is Discord a, a, a good program or a bad program? Is it is it a nice piece of software? Is it a really crappy piece of software? I don't know. Here's what I do know. It's licensed under a proprietary license. The source code is closed source, right? I can't audit the code. I can't view the code. I can't modify the code. I really have absolutely no freedom to do what I would want to do typically with my software, which is to modify it and tweak it and hack on it and things like that. I can't do that with Discord because of the license. So the license is the reason it is garbage. As such, all proprietary software, in my opinion, I'm going to label as proprietary garbage. Even proprietary software that I use, because all of us have to use proprietary software on occasion. You'll need proprietary drivers for certain hardware to work. 
in real life. Sometimes you're working on other people's computers, uh, work computers, things like that, where you have to interact with these proprietary programs. And are they garbage? Yes. Even if I have to use them, I'm still saying that proprietary software is garbage, not from a technological standpoint, but from a ideological standpoint, from a freedom standpoint, it's garbage. I also noticed in the question he, he mentioned if the software does something really well and is easy to use, is it garbage? I, I don't care. Uh, being garbage has nothing to do with is it easy to use, hard to use? That's not the point. Again, it's all about the licensing. Does it do something really well? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't care. Again, it's all about the licensing. If it's not licensed under a free and open source license, I don't want to use it uh, unless I just absolutely have to for work reasons or school reasons or maybe, you know, it's, there's no free and open source alternative because you do run into that in certain kinds of software. There's just no free software available. In that case, you have to use proprietary software. He mentions, I try not to limit myself to what I use. I can understand if you don't care about the free software movement at all. I, I'm not trying to make you care. I'm letting you know the free software movement exists. Free and open source software has real world benefits. I think that not everybody has heard that message. So I just want to get the message out there. And if you hear that message and it resonates with you, great. If you hear that message and you're like, nah, don't care, that's fine too. Again, we all make the choices for ourselves as far as the software we choose to use. You don't have to justify your choices to me, which is kind of what you're doing with this question. Like, you know, hey, I have to use proprietary software, DT. Tell me why I shouldn't. Look, you already know probably why you shouldn't. Yeah. Moving on, the next question. Hey, DT, will you please grow your hair for us? Please upvote this if you want to see DT with hair. I, I have hair. I want to grow my hair for you. Like, look, you know, this camera, I mean, it's not like a really high class camera, but it's a pretty decent camera with a pretty nice lens on it. You can clearly see my hairline. I've got a full head of hair. And right now I haven't shaved my head in a couple of days. I have a full head of hair. Repeat after me. DT is not bald. And the next question is, hey, DT, why don't you make your videos available as audio podcasts so we can listen to them while driving? I've actually had this question asked to me many, many times over the history of the channel is a lot of people like listening to the videos while driving in a car or maybe working out, running on a treadmill at the gym or whatever it happens to be. They're not actually watching a screen. They just prefer to have some earbuds in or listening it on the speakers of the car or whatever it happens to be and I get that but here's the thing my videos most of them are actually video content where I'm doing stuff on screen I'm going to make them as a video I'm not also going to put in a bunch of extra work to also you know render a separate like audio file and then upload it to all of these proprietary podcasting sites that they need to be on where I'd have to create accounts that's a lot of it actually is a lot of extra work for me for a very small percentage of you that would want the audio only. And it's, it's just not worth it. And, and ultimately, that's more of a you problem than a me problem. It's not my problem that my videos are videos. If you want my videos as audio only, you have to figure out how to solve that problem yourself. I bet you can figure that out. I, I, Because I have had the same issue myself of certain YouTubers I follow or sometimes in just YouTube in general. I want to listen to audio only while I'm working out at the gym. And I know, I, I know I've been able to solve that problem. I'm going to just put it out there to you. I'm not actually going to give you an answer to this. I want you to solve this problem for yourself. The next question, hey DT, have you thought about making a video from vanilla Emacs to Doom Emacs? There are a lot of configurations that need to be done. For example, Doom automatically puts agenda files in another location, yada, yada, yada. Installing packages is also different in Doom. So have I thought about making a video using standard vanilla GNU Emacs and then building a configuration to something like Doom Emacs? Yes, I have. In fact, I've actually done that. I've actually done videos on that. I haven't done a lot of videos on them, but I have used standard GNU Emacs before, and I've actually built a very lengthy config of uh, two, three, four thousand lines long. I forgot how long my GNU Emacs config got, but I tried to basically take GNU Emacs and install everything from Doom Emacs, all the features that Doom Emacs has. I tried to replicate that 
with a standard GNU Emacs config, and I was able to do that. And in fact, if you go to my .files repository on my GitLab, I do have a GNU Emacs config. Now, I haven't tried to use that config in about two years and there have been some updates to Emacs so that config if you tried to use it I, I don't know there may be some issues with it but yes I've done that and uh, do I need to do that again probably not uh, essentially the stuff I do on Doom Emacs does translate to GNU Emacs he mentions installing packages is different in Doom yes it is it, it's a little different but here's the thing GNU Emacs actually the old way of installing packages on GNU Emacs were the standard way for decades. Recently, GNU Emacs with their latest version, what is it, uh, version is it 28 or 29, I forget the, the latest version uh, number for Emacs, but they've recently moved to using straight. Straight is a, a different kind of package management system available for Emacs, and that's kind of what Doom does. Uh, Doom adds some extra layers on top of it to where they really streamline their package management system to where all you do is add, you know, just a list of packages to a config file and you restart Doom Emacs and it just installs them all for you. And it's really magical <laughs> what Doom Emacs does for you. The other reason I choose to use Doom Emacs these days and I recommend it to people is it's so much easier for a beginner Emacs user to use Doom than GNU Emacs. GNU Emacs is a nightmare if you don't know anything about Emacs. The other reason I recommend Doom Emacs over GNU Emacs is because if you're going to install all the stuff that Doom does anyway, chances are you're going to have a config file that is thousands of lines long and it's not going to be well optimized. Don't be surprised if your GNU Emacs that mimics Doom is really slow and flaky and buggy. And that's kind of why even after I did my experiment where I took GNU Emacs and I kind of made it into Doom Emacs, it still wasn't as good as Doom Emacs. It still wasn't as performant as Doom Emacs. Doom Emacs does a lot with speed optimizations and things like that, that just normal Emacs users like you and me are not going to be well equipped to handle. So let the professionals handle this. Doom Emacs has already done so much work for you. It's the reason I use it, and it's the reason I recommend you using it as well. And the final question. I get these kinds of questions a lot regarding what I'm doing for a current job right now. Hey, DT, what is your job? Or are you just a YouTuber? Now, those of you that have been following the channel for a while, you guys know that YouTube is my full-time job right now. It's been my full-time job for about three years since the pandemic, right? Since the shutdown. You know, before that, I was working as a manager uh, in human resources for a large retail company. I actually was working in retail uh, for a number of years. I actually enjoyed that line of work. I enjoyed management positions, especially positions where I get to teach people, train people. And I, I was always a good teacher, and you know, regardless of the topic, whether it be a setting like this or in real life in the workplace, having to train people to do a particular job or a task. You know, I, I feel like that's kind of always been my calling in life. And since switching over to just making video content on platforms like YouTube, I've kind of carried that on. I, you know, I do this essentially to train people, to teach people. And related to this question about about my job and am I still just a full-time YouTuber? I often get those of you uh, that know me a little better through social media or sometimes privately through email or whatever it happens to be. A lot of you guys have asked me questions about how I like being a full-time YouTuber now that I've done it for a while. Do I find it rewarding, challenging, pros and cons? I will say it's not for everybody. It, it's not I know a lot of people, because I, I talk to so many, especially those of you that first start YouTube channels, I, I'll find somebody that's just made their first couple of videos and be like, hey, good good video, good job, man, things like that. And people, will just, hey, DT, thanks for the comment. You inspire me. I hope to be like you one day. I, I want to do YouTube full time. And guys, I, I want you to be aware of, you know, again, it's not something... For one thing, you're not going to make a ton of money unless you're like, I don't know, PewDiePie or Mr. Beast or somebody like, you know, somebody crazy popular. Like the, to make any kind of serious money on YouTube, you have to be a much bigger YouTuber than somebody like me. I, I'm able to make enough money to get by, right? But I'm not going to get rich doing this, right? This is, and a lot of people think that I, I there's no work involved in it. Just turn on a camera, start talking, talk for a few minutes. People put out a, a video that's, you know, I don't know, eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes long. And that's all the work that went into it. And some YouTubers 
you know, when they start, that's about all the work they put into it. They take a, a quick video on their phone, and they just upload it. They don't edit it. And that's cool in the beginning, but the more and more that you get into this stuff and start playing with audio and video and video editing, audio editing, and all of this stuff, creating the thumbnails and the titles and all of that, it's hours and hours and hours of work that go into every video. So it's real work, right? And it's, it's like working a full-time job. In some cases, it's more hours sometimes than working a full-time job. It's definitely more headaches than working a regular job. And the reason it's more headaches is because at a regular job, there's benefits. I've got paid time off. I've got sick time. And, and you know, it's not my company. Ultimately, if, you know, I, I don't have to worry about everything, right? But this, this is different. This is all me. Everything revolving around my YouTube channel, my YouTube content, it all revolves around me. It all falls on me. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure to keep working, to keep putting out that content. There's no sick time. If I don't feel good for a few days or even a couple of weeks, you know, I, I can't just stay at home, right? Because again, I, if I don't work, I don't get paid, right? It's a little bit different when you're working for yourself compared to working for the man. That being said, I'm really happy making video content. I do love the process. I like turning on a camera and talking. I like, you know, playing with different settings as far as video settings, audio settings. I like video editing. You know, some people offload all that work to somebody else. They outsource, you know, a lot of this kind of work. For me, I actually enjoy overall the process of making a video. I enjoy making the thumbnails. It's, I, I like the work. Now, it is challenging. Yes, it's hard work. There is a lot of time involved, but I do find it rewarding. A lot of people, another question that people often ask is, hey, DET, will you ever quit YouTube or maybe you know, start new channels, things like that? And, you know, I probably won't ever quit YouTube or uh, let me rephrase that. I probably won't ever quit making video content because I, again, I enjoy the process. Who knows what YouTube's going to be in the future. YouTube may not even exist in five years. Who knows? But other video platforms will exist. I'll still be making video content. Will I be making video content about Linux? You know what? I don't know. Maybe. I, I would say probably not, though. Uh, if I'm being honest, would I still be making Linux content in five years? Probably not. Uh, Ten years? I'd say definitely not. If I'm still doing this that far into the future and I really don't have much to say about anything else for me I do like teaching people stuff and I could see me eventually starting new channels other channels and maybe focusing on them uh, trying to teach people other things other areas of expertise maybe that I have other than Linux content but who knows where any of us are going to be in a few years this is just all hypothetical I will say right now I'm very comfortable in my work life doing the video content and I'm really appreciative for all of you guys that have supported me over the last five years every one of you that have subscribed to the channel that have subscribed to me over on Patreon to help support me financially I really appreciate all of you guys that have viewed my content on YouTube and Odyssey without you guys obviously I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode, James Maxim, Matt Mimmit, Mitchell, Paul, Royal West, Armor Dragon, Bash Potato, Chuck, Commander Angry, George Lee, Methos, Nate Uryan, Paul, Peace Arch and Fedora, Polytech, Realities for Less Red Profit, Roland, Tools, Devler, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because... I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work, want to see more videos about Linux and free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.